And that was awesome, guys. Thank you very much. You know, it's unique. Um, let's see, Nick and, and Emily both uh, very talented music. They also are very good weightlifters. You know, they both compete, and then our guitar player up here, Jarrett. So you guys are uh, very talented that they can be both musical and strong, you know. Hey, if you would have your Bibles today and, and turn, with them, turn with me to uh, the book of Jonah in the Old Testament. If you didn't bring a Bible, then grab the one that's in the seat back in front of you and turn to page 657 in the Old Testament. Now, if you got in today and didn't get a copy of the outline, hold your hand up. <clears throat> Our ushers will make sure you have one of those. Um, we have a team that puts together DVDs and CDs of all of our Sunday services. If you'd like one of those, go to the Visitor Welcome Center in the back. But just for these next two Sundays, I'm going to make you a special deal. If you would like a word-for-word -word manuscript that I preach from, you know, we all learn in different ways. Some of us have to learn by seeing. Some of us have to learn by hearing others. Uh, we learn better when we read, so if you'd like a word-for-word -word manuscript of this week's sermon or next, if you would email me, steve at mycalvary.org, I will cut you a special deal. Just this week only, $19.99. <laughs> and normally 20 No, I'm kidding. They're absolutely free if you would like to have those, and, and I would challenge you to, uh, to do that and then uh, study what I've, what I've presented to you today and check it against the Word of God, and if I'm wrong, you call me on it. Okay, that's, uh, that's our responsibility to each other. Now, if you're unfortunate enough to take a religion course at most secular universities, you'll find that the stories of Noah and the story of Jonah draws the most ridicule of any story in the Bible. These stories are difficult for many to accept because they require a belief in miracles. Now, what are miracles? Well, a miracle is a divine interruption in the natural course of things. That is, we have the natural course of things, and then God decides to interrupt that. It is an interruption of what normally takes place in the natural world. Now, let me give you a couple of examples. Water on its own does not normally turn into wine, unless, of course, you've invited Jesus to your wedding reception. Then there's a good chance that might happen. Um, five loaves and two fishes are always insufficient to feed a multitude, unless, of course, the hands that are breaking them are the hands that created the world. Now, a God who can create all things out of nothing, get this, a God who can create all things out of nothing has absolutely no problem performing miracles. And I find it ironic that those who mock the miracles of the Bible find themselves in the absence of a belief in God, having to justify an even greater miracle, and that is that everything formed itself out of nothing. Now, would you not agree that would be a greater miracle than anything ever recorded in Scripture? Because we know that nothing causes itself to be. There has to be a cause for every effect. And so atheists who deny and mock the miracles of the Bible try to explain the origin of the universe, they contradict themselves. So logically speaking, when you read about a miracle in the Bible, um, they are very defensible from an intellectual standpoint. Now, if you interpret the events of Genesis correctly, then you will not have any problems when you come to the story of Jonah, nor of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, or any passage of Scripture where you encounter miracles. However, because of the miraculous elements that are contained in this book, and you'll see there are more than just one miracle, that's in the book of Jonah. Some have said that the book should not be taken literally, but rather it should be interpreted along the lines of an allegory, a parable, or even myth. And I couldn't disagree more. And I stand with a whole army of conservative scholars who believe that the book of Jonah should be interpreted exactly as it is written, and that is literally. So let me give you some, some reasons this morning before we get into the text as to why we should interpret Jonah in a literal fashion. The first is the use of literal language, okay? Now, in historical passages in the Old Testament, we see, of course, you know the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, New Testament was written in Greek, and Hebrew is a very difficult language written from right to left. I can remember when I studied Hebrew, the reason I'm bald today is because I studied Hebrew, because I pulled my hair out, okay? It was extremely, extremely difficult. However, when you come to the Hebrew of the Old Testament, and as you're reading passages, um, 
you notice something that's known as the while consecutive. Now, don't let me just blow you away with that big technical term. A while consecutive is a literary device that was used by the writers of the Old Testament to indicate when they were writing historical narrative. We find the while consecutive in Genesis. Now, that's significant. We find the while consecutive in Ruth. We find the while consecutive in 1 Samuel, as well as many other historical passages. So that's one reason. Another reason is that we have real names mentioned. That is, we find a, two proper names, Jonah and then his father Amittai. Also, we have real cities mentioned that have been confirmed by archaeology. The city of Nineveh, the, the, the city of Joppa, and of course Tarshish. In 2 Kings 14.25, the writer of that book mentions a prophecy that Jonah made. So we know that he was a real historical figure. There's also another argument, and it's not as strong as the first, and that is ancient tradition. And it's here that we have to be careful. The Jewish historian Josephus referred to it in a historical context, and he has quite a bit of credibility among ancient historians. In the Apocrypha, now let's be careful there, the group of books between the Old and New Testament that Catholics regard as being Scripture, that we do not regard as being Scripture, and we won't get into why we don't. If you'd like to know why, stop by the office, and I'll be happy to to explain that to you. However, the writers of the Apocrypha also consider Jonah to be a real historical figure. Also, 1st, 2nd, 3rd century church fathers interpreted Jonah in a historical light. But now the most powerful one, and that is the testimony of Jesus. After all, what higher authority do you have than the Son of God? On two occasions, Christ mentioned Jonah. The last few weeks in youth group, we've studied the entire book of Jonah. So any questions that you have about the story today, you just go ask one of our teenagers and they, I'm sure they can all tell you, okay? We've studied the book of Jonah. We memorized this verse, Matthew 12, 40. For as Jonas, that's in the King James, was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So Jesus likens his crucifixion, his burial, and his resurrection to the ordeal that Jonah went through in the belly of the whale. In Luke chapter 11, Jesus also mentions that the people of Nineveh repented at his, pre at, at his preaching in the cities that Christ had preached to did not. So it's very clear that Jesus saw this book as being historical. Now, what about the background of the book? Jonah had a very unique ministry, and that is that if you read the Bible from cover to cover, which, by the way, you should. In fact, somebody on Facebook the other day, I can't remember who it was, posted that they had just read the Bible through from cover to cover, and I can't remember who that was. But if you're in the audience, congratulations. You know, I don't know what system you use for reading your Bible, but I would encourage you before you go to heaven that uh, you at least read God's Word from cover to cover. And I'll admit there are some parts of the Bible that are more interesting than others, but it's all good. And you should take time to read it. If you read four chapters a day, starting in January, you can have the whole entire Bible read cover to cover, usually before Christmas time. So I would encourage you to do that at some point. But however, if you read the books of First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First Second Chronicles, you'll notice that, that the one thing the prophets all had in common was that they ministered during very uh, tumultuous times. That is, that there was a threat of foreign invasion, there was a famine, uh, there was a siege during the ministry of Elisha where things got so bad in the city, parents actually began eating their children. I mean, I think that qualifies as being pretty bad times. Um, but when you come to the story of Jonah, you'll find that Jonah ministered during the reign of Jeroboam II, king of Israel. And Jeroboam II reigned from 782 to uh, 753 B.C. He reigned some 29 years there in the northern kingdom of Samaria. And it was under his reign that the northern kingdom actually reached the pinnacle of its power. That is, the economy was good. There was no threats of foreign invasion. The army was strong. There was plenty of food. There were no famines to speak of. So you kind of get the idea that Jonah had a very easy career, that there weren't many difficulties that Jonah faced. And uh, he had a smooth ride. Now, little did he know, though, that God was saving the most challenging ordeal of his life for his latter years. Now, if we were had time to study the whole book, here's how the book breaks down. Chapter 1 is the refusal. That's what we'll talk about today. Chapter 2 is the rescue. Maybe you never looked at the large aquatic creature swallowing Jonah as a rescue. But that's precisely what it was. God was rescuing Jonah from his uh, rebellion. Chapter 3, that's the best part of the book. So don't skip to chapters 1 and 2 and then read chapter 3. Chapter 3 is when the revival comes. Probably the greatest turning to God 
in the history of human civilization is what took place in chapter 3. And then chapter 4 we find out that uh, there's still some residual bitterness in the heart of Jonah, so now God is going to have to use a different method to get his attention. Now what I want to do today is I want to increase your knowledge of this familiar story that I'm sure many of you have heard before. And then I want to, uh, to look at some ways practically that we can apply this, but if you look at your outline, there is no way in the world we're going to get through all of this. Unless, of course, you'd like to be here while I preach an hour and a half. I don't think you won't do that, and you couldn't stand that. So we'll, uh, we'll break this down into, into, two, uh, into two segments, okay? Hey, if you have your Bibles, look at Jonah chapter 1. Keep your Bible open the entire time, and you can read along with us. Uh, verse 1, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying... Now, Jonah's name means dove, okay? His father's name means truth. You say, Pastor Steve, what does that mean? It means that Jonah's name means dove and that his father's name means truth. Uh, don't read more into that than what's there. Uh, my name means crowned, and I don't know what that means either. I don't know if my mother's here today. I don't know what went into the thought processes in naming me Stephen, but uh, my name means crowned, certainly not with hair. My son, my son Nathan's name means gift from God, and I had no idea what his name meant when I picked his name. Uh, I picked his name after the prophet, Nathan in the Bible. I also named him after uh, a young man that I played football with in high school who had a tremendous impact on my life, Nathan Dorsey. He's a pastor to this day. But some really great spiritual thoughts went into his middle name. That is, I named him Brett. Now, who do you think I named him after? Brett Farr. <laughs> Another great, great man in the kingdom of God. Okay? Uh, Daniel, <coughs> my other son's name, <coughs> means, <coughs> means God is my judge. Of course, I named him after Daniel the prophet, and uh, his middle name, Rhett, is named after Captain Rhett Butler. <laughs> know that story, the uh, Gone to the Wind? That's who I named him after, okay? Uh, no significance whatsoever. Chapter, uh, verse 2, arise and go. Now, let's, let's stop there. This was a very unique command from God. It was very unique. Had God said, Jonah, prophesy against this certain city from the safety and security of your homeland, then it might have been a little bit easier. By the way, most prophets did that. God said to different prophets, now I want you to go and speak against this group of people, speak against the Philistines, speak against the Egyptians, speak against Edom, speak against all the, Syria, all these nations surrounding you, and you can do it from the courtesy of your own living room. It's quite a different story, though, for God to tell Jonah, now I want you to get up, take a road trip, and I want you to go stand and look these people in the eye and tell them exactly what I have to say. That's a, lot, that's a little more difficult. So where does where is, where is God want him to go? He said, I want you to go to Nineveh, the great city. Now at this time in history, Nineveh was the capital of the Assyrian Empire. This empire was strong and was getting stronger. At this particular time, they were locked in a struggle with mountain tribes to the north called the Urartu. In fact, the Urartu had actually beaten the Assyrians in several military engagements, and they had pushed their border to within 100 miles north of the city of Nineveh. So the folks of Nineveh were at this time a little bit on edge. Now, Nineveh was located across from the modern city of Mosul in Iraq. Some of you who have served uh, tour of tours of duty in Iraq, maybe you had the opportunity to go to Mosul. And if you did, you were just within a stone's throw of this city. Now, archaeology has shown that Nineveh was a massive city at the time of Jonah. In fact, they've estimated the population as being around 750,000 people. Scholars think it may, be, may have been the largest city on earth at that time. And we're talking about a, a city the size of Omaha for population, so it was an incredibly uh, large city. But don't fall into the trap of thinking that bigger is better. Okay? Nineveh was a very wicked city. God said, Jonah, I want you to arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. God told Jonah to go and warn them of coming judgment because their wickedness literally has come up before the throne of God in heaven. Now, in Hebrew, what literally the writer said here is that their, their sin stinks to highest heaven. That is, as God surveyed the landscape of the world, there were other wicked cities, there were other wicked places, certainly wherever men are present, you can bet there's going to be sin, but this particular place caught the, the, the attention of God, literally, that, that God smelled the stench of the city. Now, what was it that made Nineveh so bad? Well, the Assyrians were known in the ancient world for brutality and violence. 
when it came to murder and torture, they had cornered the market on the best methods of, of, uh, of doing it. People were around Mesopotamia, around uh, Palestine, were absolutely terrified of the Assyrians. There were two kings in particular that the historical record shows their brutality. Ashurbanipal usually tore off the lips and hands of his conquered foes. Now, that's a really pleasant fella that you'd like to go have coffee with, wouldn't it? Tears off lips and hands. There was another king, though, that decided to outdo him, and he commenced to skinning people alive, and then he'd make great piles of their skulls. Now, knowing this, would you want to go to Nineveh? Would you? I don't think I would either. Um, I imagine this is how it went down. God said, Jonah, son of Amittai, arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and there I want you to preach against it and, because their wickedness has come up before me. And I'm sure Jonah said, God, you are absolutely right. Those people are low down, dirty, rotten scoundrels. In fact, let's just skip the whole part about prophesying. And God, why don't you pull some of that action that you pulled at Sodom and Gomorrah and just wipe them off the map. They stink to high heaven. But by the way, do you know where the two most dangerous places are on earth right now? They want to venture a guess? Uh, there's a website and when I give you this website, I have not been on it in three years, okay, three or four years. So if you log into this website today and there's something awful, then I'm not endorsing everything on the website. It's called www.comebackalive.com. Now, if you travel around the world with any degree, I would challenge you to get on this website because the guy has listed every place on earth that American citizens should never, ever go. And by the way, if you do find out that you're there, Here's what to stay away from, and, this, and some of his advice might actually get you back with your skin intact. Now, are you ready? The second most dangerous place in all the earth, there's a map here that I put on the screen, is in the Horn of Africa, Mogadishu, Somalia. There hasn't been a functioning government there since 1991. Some of you are familiar with the uh, story of Black Hawk Down and the Battle of Mogadishu. I sat on the plane coming back years ago from Atlanta, and there was a, a military fellow there, and I saw that he had a, a ring there that commemorated the Battle of Mogadishu, so I struck, struck up a conversation with him, and he was in that battle and told me everything that took place. It was quite an interesting plane ride. But this is not a place, guys, that you would book to spend your wedding anniversary, okay? Mogadishu, Somalia. There's a more dangerous place on earth, though, and it's not around the world. It's in El pa south of El Paso, Texas, in Juarez, Mexico. Back in 2010, this city saw 3,000 murders. Imagine that. All related, of course, to drug cartel activity. Now, let's, let's, uh, let's think up this scenario here. Today, I'm, I'm sitting on my couch. I'm uh, planning my week ahead. i uh, got a lot of stuff going on this week. And all of a sudden, God says, Steve, I have a change in plans for you. Now, I want you to arise, and I want you to go to Mogadishu, Somalia, and there I want you to preach repentance to the folks there. I want you to go into that heavy Islamic culture that hates Americans, that hates Christians. And I want you there to tell them about my love. Do you really think I'd be jumping for joy at that assignment? I don't think so. What if God told me today, Steve, get in your car, drive all the way through Texas. You stop at Chick-fil-A while you're down there. That's what I usually do. Uh, that would actually sweeten the deal quite a bit. Cross the border into Juarez, and there you tell those drug cartels to, to knock it off, to cut it out. Uh, you know, the main thing that would stop me would be fear. I would be fearful of my life. And so this is precisely what God was asking Jonah to do. Now, in Nineveh, there was a wanton disregard for human life. Now, let's think of some contemporary examples. Adolf Hitler. Everybody knows Adolf Hitler. You know, he was responsible for the deaths of 20 to 25 million people, directly and indirectly, during World War II, there was one, though, that outdid him, Joseph Stalin, the, the leader of the former Soviet Union. He managed to kill 45 million people, mostly Ukrainian peasants who resisted his collectivization efforts. However, he was outdone by one other in the 20th century, and that is Mao Zedong, who killed 65 million people. Now, understand this. There has always been murder in society. If you'll think back to the earliest pages of the Bible, the second sin ever recorded was the son of Adam and Eve, Cain, murdered his brother Abel. So society will always have to deal with this problem. However, though, when the taking of human life becomes the norm rather than the exception, then God deems the sin of that society as being intolerable. Now, we all agree that these people that I mentioned are bad people. We all agree that Nineveh was a bad place that probably deserved to be wiped off the map. But I think that as Americans, we have to look ourselves in the mirror 
and ask ourselves this question, what does God think of us? Does our wanton disregard for human life also stink in the nostrils of God? Since 1973, we have cornered the market on killing the unborn. 50 million since 1973. And just because something is legal certainly doesn't make it moral. Now, God is not a Republican. God is not a Democrat. How dare you try to bind the almighty God to any political party's ideology? Political parties would be very wise, though, to bind themselves to his principles. But I will say this. God is pro-life. And that is God values unborn life. God values born life. God values life in the nursing home. God values life that is mentally incapacitated. God values invited life. God values life at every level. And so should God's people. Now what this passage tells us is that God is interested in the spiritual and the political climate of nations. God notices. God's active. And God takes sin very, very seriously. Now let's, how does Jonah respond to this? Verse 3. But Jonah rose up to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. So he went down to Joppa, found a ship which was going to Tarshish, paid the fare, went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Now, if you look at this next map on the PowerPoint, you'll see that Nineveh was about 500 miles to the northeast of Palestine. If Jonah would have traveled by caravan, which was the preferred mode of travel in those days, uh, he could have made it there in about a month. If he walked... It would have taken even longer. But what does he decide to do? Jonah goes down to the port city of Joppa. He books a fare on a ship heading to Tarshish. Scholars believe that Tarshish is the city of Tartessus in southern Spain, 2,000 miles away to the west in the opposite direction of Nineveh. Now, if you'll notice twice back in verse 3, his flight is described as being from the presence of the Lord. So it didn't really matter where he was headed. The destination was irrelevant. The key thing, though, is that he was going without God's presence. And I think that question needs to be asked as we face decisions in life. And that is, is what I am about to do bring me closer to God or does it take me further away? Jonah has a choice to make 500 miles over, over, over sand with God, with God's blessing, with him as his companion, or 2,000 miles over the deep, dark, blue, stormy Mediterranean Sea. You think his thinking here is clouded a little bit? Uh, He makes a very poor choice. Verse 4, the Lord hurled a great wind on the sea. Now the verb hurled here gives the idea of a soldier in combat flinging a spear. So now the God that Jonah has served his entire life, now close to retirement, Jonah finds himself literally in combat with Almighty God. And there was a great, by the way, in those conflicts, God always wins. Okay, it's the ultimate exercise in futility to fight against God and his will. There was a great storm on the sea, so the ship was about to break up. We're not talking about an afternoon thunder shower. What we're talking here is huge waves, intense rain, powerful winds, strong enough to destroy the ship. Then the sailors became afraid, and every man cried to his God, and they threw the cargo which was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. Have you ever heard this phrase that foxholes hide no atheists? Have you ever heard that phrase? That means that when your life's on the line, everybody gets religious. These guys were professional sailors. They had seen storms before. They probably ran the the trade route from Joppa to Tarshish on a regular basis. And so dealing with storms was just part of the job. However, this was something that they had never seen. It was divine in origin. So now they're going to pray. And they also take another step. The storm reaches an intensity that they have to throw the cargo overboard. Now, they weren't hauling the cargo just for fun. Okay, this was their livelihood. This was their paycheck. And so to get the ship to ride higher in the waves and increase their chances of surviving the storm, they now ditch their cargo, their freight. And you only do that as a last resort. But now what's Jonah doing during this time? Jonah had gone below into the hold of the ship, lain down and fallen sound asleep. I don't know about you, but when a storm comes in at night, I always get up because I'm a light sleeper. I like to get up and and if it's an intense storm, I'd like to see if my neighbor's tree is going to come crashing through my, my living room. I watch the hail come down. And winter storms, I really love to get up and watch. But you know, my father was a very heavy sleeper. And I can remember in my childhood one time, we had a storm come through in the summer. And mother got us out of bed and, and put us in the hallway and threw the mattress on top of us, preparing for the end of the world. And then she went in and tried to wake dad up, and there was no waking dad up. 
In fact, the storm picked our swing set up and threw it against the wall that he was sleeping on. And he still slept through the entire world. He woke up the next morning as though nothing happened, had a good night's rest. That was what Jonah was doing. Jonah was sound asleep while all their guys were calling on the various gods. Jonah, who was fleeing from the true God, was taking a nap. Verse 6, the captain approached him and said, How is it that you are sleeping? Get up and call on your God. Perhaps your God will be concerned about us so that we will perish. Now, the fact that Jonah was sleeping leads me to believe that he was exhausted. I wonder how many sleepless nights Jonah had spent trying to rationalize his disobedience. You know, disobedience takes a tremendous toll upon you physically. And I believe that Jonah had spent many sleepless nights wrestling with God, trying to rationalize his disobedience. You ever been there? Have you ever done that? You ever done something wrong and your conscience just gnaws at you and gnaws at you and gnaws at you? Read Psalm 32 sometime. Psalm 32 was one of the penitent psalms. I believe there are six penitent psalms uh, in that book. David had committed sin with Bathsheba. And uh, he had actually committed adultery. And you know the story. Pastor Carl went through the, the life of David. And so to cover up the adultery and her pregnancy, uh, David now has to kill her husband, Uriah the Hittite. And, and so Uriah's dead. David brings Bathsheba. And everybody says, oh, the king is so great taking care of this woman uh, now that Uriah is dead. That wasn't the case at all. Public perception was wrong. God knew the truth. And for almost a year, David hides his sin. Read Psalm 32. And David talks about the physical effects that hiding his guilt takes upon, uh, takes upon his, his life. Verse 7, each man said to his mate, come let us cast lots so that we may learn on whose account this calamity has struck us. The soldiers realize that this storm is in retribution for someone's sin. So they want to find out who the guilty party is. So they cast lots. Now the scripture in the Old Testament records three other times in which they cast lots. One was when Achan in the book of Joshua stole the, the sacred items from the city of Jericho. The second was when they were figuring out who was going to get the uh, first division of land there that they had conquered in Canaan in the latter parts of Joshua. The third was in 1 Samuel on the selection of Saul to be king. This is the fourth. Now probably what they did was they pulled everybody down below and there you have the captain and the, the ancient practice of casting lots was they had two stones. On one side was a dark color, on the other side was a light color. And they probably lined everybody up in single file and they says, we're going to find out who's responsible. So they would roll those stones. If you got two dark sides up, that was no, which meant this is not the guilty person. If uh, you got two light sides up, they took that as a sign from a God that uh, this is the guilty person. So now we can take this person out and we can slap him and kick him and stomp him and do whatever, okay? If you had one bright, one light side, one dark side, then they would roll again, okay? And so we know here that God superintended the, uh, uh, the process. Now, they cast lots, the lot fell on Jonah. So then they said to him, tell us now, on whose account has this calamity struck us? What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? He, see, the guilty now is getting interrogated. Verse 9, he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. Jonah says, I'm Jewish, and that is I'm one of God's covenant people. Now, if you would look at your Bibles, look how Lord is spelled there. In your Bibles, you, sh you should have capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. That's significant. Now, that when you see in the Old Testament the Lord's name there spelled in all caps, what we're looking at here is, is, a, is a phenomenon known as a tetragrammaton, or the four-letter name of God. It is Yahweh. It is Y-H-W-H. It was a, the name of God that the Jews revered above all else. In fact, they were really hesitant to speak it. They often would substitute Adonai or L and then small O-R-D. This is the name of God that God told Moses in the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. So Jonah said, I worship Yahweh who made the sea and the dry land. Then in verse 10, the men became extremely frightened, and they said to them, Are you nuts? Are you crazy? Actually, they said, How could you do this? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. So they said to, so they said to him, What should we do to you that the sea may become calm for us? For the sea was becoming increasingly stormy. That's while they were down below casting lots and interrogating Jonah. They, uh, the storm was getting worse. 
So Jonah, they look at Jonah and they say, listen, you got us into this mess, pal. Now you tell us how we can get out. So Jonah comes up with a rather unique solution. In verse 12, he said to them, pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will become calm for you. For I know that on account of me, this great storm has come upon you. Now, this is one of the few places in the book of Jonah where you actually give him a little bit of credit. And that is, he owns the situation. He realized that his actions had put others in harm's way. His presence literally was toxic to the men of that ship. And let me just say here that when you and I engage in open rebellion against God, that is that we clearly have two paths to follow. One is a path of obedience. The other is clearly a path of disobedience, a path that takes us away from God. When we engage in open rebellion against God, we become a detriment to those who are around us. Fathers, it's very difficult to lead your family when you're, when you're not being obedient to God. Mothers, it's very difficult to be the kind of mother to your children you should be when you're living in open disobedience against God. Because when we do that, not only do we hurt ourselves, but we also expose those we love to the consequences of our actions. Now, don't mistake this action here for an act of heroism. In asking to be thrown overboard, Jonah literally was asking to die. He was asking for suicide. That is, that, that rebellion was so deeply ingrained in his heart that he would rather die than go to Nineveh and do God's will. So God's got a lot of work to do. In verse 13, however, the men rode desperately to return to land, but they could not, for the sea was becoming even stormier against them. That is, unlike the people of Nineveh, these guys actually valued life. They said, you're telling us to throw you over, but we're not going to kill you. We're not going to throw you over. You're going to drown. So now they begin to double their efforts to bring the ship to land, but it was all in vain. So verse 14, then they called on the Lord. Notice there, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. They're now praying to the God that Jonah introduced them to. And they're going to direct their prayers for the, where they can be heard. We earnestly pray, O Lord, do not let us perish on account of this man's life. And do not put innocent blood on us, for you, O Lord, have done as you please. They realize that they now have no other choice. In order to survive, they have to get Jonah off the ship. And they knew exactly what throwing him overboard meant, and that was death. So Jonah would drown. And what they want to do now is they want to know, they want the, the Lord to know that they're only doing this as a last resort. Little do they know, though, that God had other plans. In verse 15, so they picked up Jonah, threw him into the sea, and the sea stopped its raging. You know, one of the greatest things you can do for your children is to have them under the teaching of God's Word. I can remember, and many of you probably are having memories, if you grew up in church, of the first time you heard the story of Jonah and the whale. And I can remember the first time I heard this story. Kent Maddox was my Sunday school teacher, and he is still serving God to this day still teaching boys and girls as he taught me so many years ago. And I'd like to say I was one of his best students, but I, I spent a lot of time out in the hallway uh, because I was, was not very, very obedient. But I can remember Kent Maddox telling us this story of Jonah. And he said, I want you to go home and I want you to do this. Take a glass and pour a glass of Coke. It's not pop down south. It's Coke. Everything is Coke, whether it's Sprite, 7-Up. Anything that's a, that's a carbonated drink is a Coke. He says, I want you to go home and pour a glass of Coke, <clears throat> watch it fizz up, and then stick your finger into it, and immediately the fizzing will stop. And so I went home and did that, and Mother says, what are you doing? I'm just doing what my Sunday school teacher said. And he says, when you, when you see the fizzing stop, I want you to imagine that as soon as Jonah was thrown overboard, as soon as the guys got rid of their toxic cargo, that immediately the storm stopped. Now, isn't it amazing that God... The God that we worship, the God that we serve, has power to stop the storm instantly. You know this happened again in the Gospels. Jesus concludes a preaching tour on one side of the Sea of Galilee, gets in the boat, says, Peter, James, John, you guys are all experienced fishermen. Take me to the other side. I'm going to take a nap. So Christ goes down into the bottom of the ship. He's asleep. And, and these disciples, experienced fishermen, run across a storm that they could not handle. And what do they do? They try everything in the world. Finally, they just think, we're going to die. Go wake Jesus up. So they go wake Jesus up. He comes up top. What does he do? Winds, waves, stop. And the Bible says immediately the storm stopped. Now, I want to tell you this. Whatever storm you find yourself in today, whether it is a storm that you created, that you caused, 
because of your sinful actions or whether you're just along for the ride and now you're having to go through the same storm that somebody else caused. Can I tell you this, that he is still the master of the sea? The winds and the waves, still the elemental forces of nature and all the powers in the universe and heaven and hell still have to do exactly what he says. And that's why we hold our faith strong. So whatever storm you find yourself in, Jesus can still calm it. Now, the calming of the storm made a huge impact on these sailors. Verse 16, then the men feared the Lord greatly. They offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. Because of Jonah, these guys came to know the truth about God. And I want you to understand this, that God was sovereign <clears throat> even through Jonah's sin. Let me say that again. God was sovereign even through Jonah's sin. I imagine God says, okay, Jonah, you're heading to Tarshish, down to Joppa. That's not where I want you to go. But I'm going to play along here because you know what? I'm sovereign and, and I can bring good out of this anyway. I got some sailors there. They're worshiping false gods. They need to know the truth. So, Jonah, I need you to, in spite of yourself, I need you to get those men saved. That's exactly what happens. Hey, even through your mistakes, God is still in control. Whether it's willful disobedience or whether it is just simply sins of omission, things you didn't really intend to do but just kind of happened because you're, uh, you're weak and fallen like myself, God can still bring good out of evil. That is, you may be thinking, what good can ever come of that crazy decision that I made back when? Listen, the record of God throughout history has been that he can bring good out of evil. I think of several instances in the life of David. I think of most prolifically, the story of Joseph, where his brothers come to him after their father died and said, Joseph, you're probably going to punish us for what, for what, you did, what we did to you in sending you to Egypt. And he said, listen, what you guys thought for evil, God meant for good. And that's exactly what God does in this story here. Now, these guys, they acknowledge God as being the true God. And obviously, some of their cargo that's left on the ship is an animal. They bring an animal up top. They build some sort of an altar. And there, as a token of the faith that they now have expressed in God, they offer a sacrifice. But it goes a step further. It says they make vows. That is, that they promise to each other that this is the God that we're going to serve. This was true conversion. These guys got saved that God was sovereign despite Jonah's sin. But now what about Jonah? Where's Jonah? Verse 17, And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah. Now obviously... There weren't biological classifications back in those days, so we're not exactly sure what type of fish it was. In Hebrew, the term is dog gadol, which literally refers to any creature that lives in the water. So that's a pretty wide variety there. Now, next week we'll talk a little bit more about what might have happened here, about what, you know, different scenarios, so you'll want to be here for that. We'll discuss that more in detail next week. But suffice it to say that a great fish, a large aquatic creature, now swallows Jonah. And Jonah was in the stomach of the fish three days and three nights. Just as Christ was in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights, so now Jonah is going to spend three days and three nights in the bowels of a dilemma, in the belly of his own circumstances. And if you would write this down, the belly of the fish, it's a great place to learn. Great place to learn. Lousy place to live. Belly of the fish, great place to learn, lousy place to live. See, Jonah's being swallowed by the great fish represented God's last attempt in trying to get his attention. Now, I'm sure God had reached out to Jonah on several occasions since he resolved to disobey him, but Jonah wouldn't listen. So now God has to increase the level of corrective measures. God has to intensify his discipline, he has to get his attention. And let me tell you, if you wake up tomorrow morning in the belly of a great fish, I think you will agree that that is a good attention getter. That's where Jonah found himself. Now, God deals with us in the exact same way. In Isaiah 118, God says, Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Now, God had put Jonah in a place where he had no place else to to run. In the belly of that fish, there was no plan B. He had exhausted all of his other options. There were no longer any alternatives. And today, this morning, I want to challenge you to stop running. You know, at various stages of our life, I think it could be said that we're running from God. Um, 
usually from for the time that we're old enough to understand the, the plan of God, we, there's a tendency in us to want to do it our own way, to try religions. The thing of grace and forgiveness is something that is just too easy for most people to accept, so we run from God. I want to challenge you that if you're running from God in the area of salvation, stop running. You know, you're far better traveling overland 500 miles to Nineveh with God as your traveling partner than trying to sail 2,000 miles to Tarshish without him. You find yourself on very perilous waters anywhere you go without God. So let me ask you this question. If you're going to run from God, where do you think you're going to go? Where are you going to hide? David said in Psalm 139, Where shall I go from your spirit? Where shall I flee from your presence? If I make my bed in hell, you're there. If I go to heaven, you're there. If I, if I go to the deepest part of the sea, you're there. If I go to the highest mountain, you're there. So running from God is the ultimate exercise in futility. But rather than run from him, how about you do this? Change directions and run towards him. Because you already find out he's already walking your direction. That is that God could have just said, okay, Jonah, go ahead. I'm going to send you to the bottom of the sea. You're going to die. God didn't do that. God was right there. And God loved him too much to leave him to his own decisions. And I want to challenge you today, stop running from God. Run towards him because he's already running towards you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and we thank you for this story. God, how we pray that today, Lord, that you would help us to seek, Lord, to not be like Jonah. But the God, that when you give us a task, God, when you call us to do something, that, Father, we would not allow fear or prejudice, Lord, or anything that's in our heart to stop us from obeying you. While heads are bowed and eyes are closed, I want to challenge you today. Stop your running. Stop running from God. If you're here today and, and, and you need to accept Christ as your Savior, do you realize the great lengths that Jesus Christ went to to save your soul? He came from heaven to earth. He was tempted in every way like we were, yet without sin. At the end of his life, he suffered and died for you and me. And if you were the only person on earth that were fallen and needed saving, Christ still would have come down here, turned water into wine, walked on water, multiplied the loaves and fishes. That's how great God's love is for you. And he's running after you. And you might as well turn and run to him. Maybe the day, though, that you've already been saved. You've accepted Christ. But maybe along the way you've made some decisions that, are, that is taking you from the presence of the Lord. And so today, you might can connect with Jonah on a very personal level. I want to challenge you this. Before you find yourself in the belly of the whale, turn and meet God and reason with him. Because where are you going to go from his presence? It will haunt you until you die. And then... If you're saved, you're going to go to heaven and spend forever with him anyway. So it's always best to do things God's way. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day that you've given to us. Lord, this timeless story. God, with so many eternal truths. God, we pray today, Lord, that we would just follow you, that we would just be obedient to do what you would have us to do. In your name we pray. Amen.